So there's different classes of model. Um, static, deterministic, uh, discrete is how the world has started, but it's grown out into this much more fluid, stochastic, dynamic world. But you can get a long way with simple models. So I said before that I could turn this into maths. Everywhere you see a positive arrow here, that's a positive effect, so think of one. Every time you see a dot, that's a negative effect. So for here, the predatory fish, the fishing, fishing benefits from having the fish. The predatory fish gets a negative effect from being fished and dies, basically. So you can turn this whole diagram on how the Great Barrier Reef and its management works into a set of zeros, ones, and minus ones. Okay, so you've just got a matrix of interactions. You then can do matrix algebra on it, so that same Richard Levins guy, he had a really productive year in the 1960s. You use his methods and you can immediately say, if I press on this part of that matrix, which bits go up and down? And you can even do that uh, with some degree of confidence about how right your prediction is. So a guy called Jeff Dambacher did all of his PhD and work on building that method into a way of looking at any kind of model of the world and being able to do that press perturbation and have some confidence about your predictions. So in a lot of questions, that, that's as far as you need to go. So for instance, he was helping them manage the Lahir gold mine in Papua New Guinea and look at the effect on the local community of having the mine. And he figured out it was because it was undermining their feast culture, it was acting as an additional source of, inf of information or dollars. Uh, that meant that they were over-exploiting the reef because they could afford to have more feasts and feasts were a way of getting to look important. So it was about, he helped them then manage how they injected money into the local community so it wasn't then undermining the, um, the reef. There's statistical modelling and there's an exploding number of ways of taking observational data and doing, uh, using it to create a model of the way the world works. So classical statistics uh, is the part that I'm the most familiar with and it's done a lot here, but there's an enormous number of things jumping out. AI and machine learning started off as a very black box way, but there's now a way of actually understanding how they're doing their learning and how to grow it to give you information. So there's currently a very smart man I work with called Fabio Baschetti, and he's got a proposal that he and I are working on around actually using artificial intelligence to help us do the modelling like the tedious part where you're forever turning the handle to get the blank thing to work. So let the AI run over that, but in a such a way that we still get the same learnings about what's the important connections in the system, what's influencing what other parts of the system. So you can work with it to understand and do this kind of knowledge discovery that's really important that's coming out of that data. So in the classicals, I can't give you as much information on these other methods. It is quite a complicated well, the parts that I've done are quite complicated and I haven't thought about how to simplify them, but it's still roughly the same. But you have a set of data, and you're trying to fit a simple model to that set of data, that, an explanation that's close enough. So in Australia it's called good enough for government work. So it's close enough that you get about the right answer, but you don't have to be super precise. And that's what a statistical model is. It's giving you a simple relationship between the observations, uh, the two different aspects, the different variables. You want to be careful of underfitting. So there's obviously a curve in this data and a straight line has gone through. That's an underfit. This is a good fit. It's giving you the right shape of what's going on. But trying to fit every data point, that's overfit. That's overkill. It's not, you're actually fitting to noise. You're not fitting to information. So the sweet spot is getting... And this is actually true of any kind of model. You want to get the right relationships out without getting bogged down in the noise. A very common kind of model that's still used in a lot of terrestrial ecology and it's actually the basis of a lot of insurance tables is what's called matrix models. You basically have a starting group and then they transition through the... Well, actually, go back the other way. this picture. Different. No, it goes this way. So you've got the transition between the different states. So these might be age classes. They might be life history stages. They might be socioeconomic classes. It's a very universal way of modelling things. Basically, you only have to know what the classes are and what's the probability of transition between them. Then you have your classical differential equation models that are probably the most com common kind of model still around, where you have a property like biomass, and then you want to say that you get a change in the biomass. That just means change of biomass over time. And in this case, it's the amount of biomass that used to be there 
Um, and then you've got how much it's eaten. So this is the, its consumption. It's eating its prey. How much of that food that you eat. So if we think of it as Beth, right? How big is Beth going to get after she's gone to Indonesia? So it's a function of how much food I consume, how well I assimilate it. So if there's a lot of chilies, um, I'm not assimilating that well because I constraints on space, well there's my oxygen too, uh, then you've got constraints on space, so you know, if they're trying to push you through the restaurant fast, you can't consume as much as if they let you sit there for ages and just keep going. So it's the same kind of idea, what's conditioning that consumption? Then you have your sources of mortality, and some of them might be fixed, or some of them might be due to predation, so you play out the different terms are the different parts of the influences on that group. So there's lots of different ways of actually pulling that together. So when I started modelling um, decades ago, the primary production part of the world didn't talk to the fish and fisheries part of the world. And those two models still can be used standalone for their own reasons. But through time there's been more and more attempts to link the models. In some instances they put a lot of focus just on one part and then they tailor they just have a little bit of forcing for the others, so it's not represented in as much detail. In other cases, they actually put as much effort into all the different parts. Um, and sometimes it's done in an even-handed way. Sometimes they pick key parts that they put a lot of detail in, with just some simple linkers in between. The most common form of model that's becoming increasingly popular is to link different kinds of models. So differential equations for some of the lower parts of the model, or lower parts of the food web, to more and more resolution as you go up the system. So we think about the different kinds of models that are out there. So these are, we think about particularly ones used in the climate impact space. This the species distribution models of the kind used by William Chung and others, where you've got properties of the system that the animal responds to, and then that influences the habitat where they can live, uh, it also influences their productivity and life history, so ultimately it gives you a spatial distribution. So you take your observations, you match that to physical properties of the world at the same locations, then you create a map of, well, they like these conditions, this is where they can live, using the statistical model to do that projection. And then you can say, if I change those physical conditions, where do they end up? And that's pretty much the basis of what William does. So he does bring in production, you're starting to bring in other connections, but that's the basic concept. And you can use that at very fine scales to help uh, tactical management of marine parks or fisheries, or at those global scales to give you an impact of climate outcome. Another common way of doing models is to, what's this models of intermediate complexity. So you pull out the key influences on it. So this is the species of interest and its life history. And then what are the key influences on that? So you've got the temperature in this case affecting the growth and mortality of this lobster. It has a very basic representation of food and habitat but not a lot of detail in it. Most of the details happen here. And then you have the, the fishing. And these parts in particular are very closely fit to data. So it's a, you know, it's a, a bit like a fancy stock assessment with extra drivers. It's very closely fit to data. It produces output that can be then fed into that same stock assessment management world. So they're already used to getting that kind of information. The most common kind of ecosystem model in the world is uh, a food web model, EcoPath with EcoSim. I think there's up to 6,500 users registered around the world. Basically what it does is it links, it has the food web and links the amount of biomass flow happening. And it was basically an economics approach. It was an economics input-output analysis that Jeff Polavina goes was asked to quickly look at Hawaii and where all the flows were, so he just grabbed that economics method, 
renamed instead of the different sectors, he put in species names, how much biomass instead of dollars was flowing through the system, and it's grown from there over the last 35 years. So you can now have dynamic differential equations through time, and there's now space, and you can link it to habitats, and those kind of things. But it is the most common way. It's just fundamentally based on who eats who, including up to the fisheries. Another method that's grown in popularity over the last 10 years, it's existed for about 25 to 30 years, but there's been an explosion in use in the last 10 to 15 years, is within the oceans, there's a fair, it's long-term observations have backed this up, but there's this fairly linear in log-log space relationship um, between the amount of something and the biomass, the body size of that thing. So you start with very small things, and then by the time you get to the big things, there's less often. And the, the steepness of that curve can show you how perturbed it is. So I have a postdoc who's helping Julia Blanchard, who's one of the key leaders on this, to actually fill in how you do a good representation of humans. So instead of a simple fishing mortality term, how do you get a human representation into the same way of modelling? It's a fairly rapid and simple way of doing the modelling, so it allows you to do large areas quite quickly. Then you can get into... Uh, the spatial model. So you can either just take the eco path with eco sim model and make it spatial and connect it to the habitats, or you can go the whole hog with me. So I bring in oceanography, I have the food web with aid structure, I have the other human users of the systems, not just the fisheries, I have the different kinds of fisheries and how they're making their decisions. <coughs> but then uh, there's the land use and how that affects the nutrients coming in from rivers. So we've got other users like energy and shipping so that you play out that entire coastal system. So none of it's done in enormous detail. I'm not going to the met metabolics of the individual fish. I have in the past. That was something I'm not doing again. But uh, you, you sort of take that step back. So instead of going, I need to worry about the metabolics of how things grow, I just have a growth term. Okay, so that's that stepping back. Over. So the different model types can cover different processes. So, for instance, most of the models that include fishing have a fairly can-do constant, just a fishing mortality term, like take this percentage of the fish each year. But you can also blow out the human uh, processes in the same way we have the physical and oceanographic here, and have a lot more uh, detail in those as well. But between them, it's best to use... So, for instance, when we do climate advice for the Australian government, we use all of these to see if we're getting the same answer across all of them, because then we have more confidence in what we're saying. If we get really different answers between them, that's still information, because that's still uncertainty we need to resolve. And it's uncertainty those managers have to actually make a decision under, so they need to be clear that we just don't know stuff yet. Now we get into what's called agent-based models. So classical analytical models sit in here, differential equation models sort of take you out to here. Statistical models work <coughs> best when you've got a huge group size, it's the fundamental basis of statistics is you've got a large sample size you're dealing with. Um, differential equations work best out there as well. But the management questions we often want to ask often fall in this middle, sort of midway life where there's more than a small number so you can't solve it analytically but you're not up to tens of thousands yet. You know, the number of people on the beach at Exmouth is tens of thousands. So that's why we use hybrid models. Now you can extend these down a little bit, but these individual agent-based models are, are really important. So the ways of thinking about them is that you're basically playing out the decision processes of those actors. So you define the actors or agents based on how they interact with other things in their environment, how they perceive their environment, and what their characteristics are. So to give you an error, um, and they have behaviour that's conditioned on rules. So this is an example for a fish in one of the models. Are you alive? That's the first question they get asked every time step. No, then go decompose. <laughs> yes, then they have to worry about, there's a lot of things that most of the time as a mother is about bookkeeping, which is why if you can get someone else to do the bookkeeping for you in a modelling platform, that help, helps a lot. But in agent-based models, you can run the, a problem where you explode to an enormous number of agents. So you tend to look to see if the group of agents has shrunk to such a small amount that you can either kill it or you can add it into another group. So that's what this is doing. So do I need to shrink? 
If, I, if I'm okay as I am, is the biomass greater than the carrying capacity? So do I need to go and be split off and to have multiple agents? Then you've got the mortality functions. Am I, do I have to run away from predators? Uh, can I go hunting? Can I find a good place to live? So if I do need to find a good place to live, I need to go off and find it. So I need to go wander, uh, move to go to the good habitat. If I'm already in good habitat, I just sort of wander around the local area. So then you get into your growth. So if I'm not dead, I can grow and I can reproduce. So that's kind of the set of simple steps that the, the model works through. So the basic premise is that you've got an environment the agent sits in, you've got the agents themselves, you've got ha what, how they interact with the environment and the objects, in, other objects in the environment that they've got to interact with. So agent to agent interactions are very dynamic. Agent to environment interactions can be dynamic too. Agent to object interactions, that's kind of like the context settings. They can't change the objects, so I can't change international global policy, I can only respond to it. And it's that kind of that kind of idea. But to give you a bit more of a tangible, tangible understanding what we're talking about, you've got what the internal state that the agent understand, understands, what it perceives, how it responds, and then how it communicates that out to other agents. So you've basically got the environment. You've got a set of interacting agents, and between those you get the emergent property. So that is not making a lot of sense, I'm guessing, that you need this kind of structure to support the agents, you need how they communicate, and then you need the planning and hierarchy as to the outcome. You might understand it as this. You have a bunch of soccer players on a the field, they're following a set of rules, you have a bunch of drunk people in the pub watching them, and you get the World Cup. <laughs> That's basically an agent-based representation of the world, okay? So there's a set of rules for people in the pub, there's a set of ru behaviour rules for people in the pub, there's a set of rules on the soccer field, and that plays out the whole game. So these kinds of models can describe a whole bunch of things. So the Conway's game of life is a very simple model. In each cell, they're just responding literally to the condition of the cell beside it. But by doing that, you can actually represent all of these kinds of things, okay? So it's a very, very simple model. It's just a couple of lines, but it can produce these amazingly complicated patterns and very, it's very dynamic. Network models are another one where it's just about information sharing and who's connected to who. Uh, it's a very good way of looking at the spread of information, the spread of disease, the spread of behaviour. In fact, it was a way that they discovered that obesity might actually be a disease. So in the sense that it's not just a lifestyle choice if you eat too much, it does look like there's bacteria that change the efficiency of how you assimilate food. And the way they figured that out was when they looked at it on networks, it was connecting and changing like a disease. It wasn't changing like a piece of information which had a bit different method of looking at how they transmit across a, across a network. And that's why they started to look at it. Okay, so there's another one that's pretty famous and it was about how humans interact. So I'll see if I can get this to work. So the obesity case, if it was just information, would it just be switching from one to the other and not... Yes. Okay. Yeah, so they were... It was the... Why are you not... Just 10 seconds. Okay, so come back to here. Other one. Ugh. Oh. If I can get it to, uh, if I can get it to, where's my mouse gone? I need to get that. Maybe maximize it. We'll just start. There we go. Okay, so what Shelling did was he looked at how people share their. Um, <laughs> this is a place that you should go and play with, basically. So. <laughs> He was looking at racial segregation in the US and what was driving it, because he was trying to get rid of hate crimes, and part of that was about where people lived. And he figured out it didn't have anything... When he went and talked to people, he wasn't finding that they actually hated. It was more that they just wanted to live next to someone who looked like them. So this is where you've got... Um, that you've got your squares and you've got your triangles. So if they're next to, in a situation they like, they're happy. If they're in a situation they don't like, they're sad. And they, the squares and triangles don't hate each other, they just want to be next to shapes like them. 
So in this, I'll see if I can get the board to come across now. So they're not all wicklings, so not all of them want yeah. to change. So for instance in that one, um, the, let's see if I can get this to slide across a bit more. This worked well on a screen that was a lot larger than this. So if I can bring it back here for 10 seconds and make the screen a lot smaller. So you can see that in this particular case, once the degree of segregation was 46%, everybody's happy. Okay? And the, you can change their degree of preference, and this time it was 50%. So there's a little bit of juggling around depending on who sits next to each other at the start. So now what happens if we change how happy they are so we start the moving so in this case they'd move if there's less than 30 percent of their, their neighbors so let's say 30 percent 33 percent of their neighbors who are the same as them but you can change it and have a look at the effect so we'll start the board actually yep. no don't start speaking to me but we're just being embarrassed mm -hmm. Basically, if it's about 50%, so if you as equal, if less than half of your neighbours are like you, you're going to get segregation of about 75 to 80%. So that's what he found. The Schilling just found that if people didn't have to hate each other to get segregation. They just had to want to live next to someone like them. So, the, which had a huge impact on the way that they were thinking about doing planning in um, in the the states of the US at the time. And, and this happens when, when there is no official law exactly. to people from the internet, okay? <laughs> yeah, so he just, this was different levels of wanting to live together and it was fairly, you know, fairly um, quickly that you started to get these bigger patterns of segregation happening. And you can look at rule following, rule breaking, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Agent based side of social behaviour is just really fascinating and a lot of fun to play with, but so I encourage you to do that kind of thing. So that's how we're covering the model type. So I'm going to go briefly into coupling and then I'll switch over to Rashid. So I talked before about how to embed models and how to do that to capture the different influences. And so sometimes that's by changing the grid, sometimes it's by linking different types of models. I also talked before about the fact that you want alternative pathways and emergent properties. So in the past they used to have a lot of detail in the plankton world and then a single term that was the fish. Or they had a lot of detail in the fish and a single term that was the food source, the plankton. And it wasn't until they started to get these more even-handed representations that they started to get alternative stable states at an ecosystem level that were meaningful because they could have different pathways of flow through the system and that involved coupling the fish model and the plankton model. So Yun Chin, for instance, uh, in France has done a lot of this and it was a lesson they had to learn in the climate space so they had to go from the human part so when I started thinking about climate questions in the 90s what they were doing was they'd run the human part of the model, the economics part, they'd, well in these days emails didn't even exist, they would send a letter to their collaborator who was in the physics model who would run the physics model and send the letter back to the economist. That would take five or six years for that cycle to turn over. Like a fax or something? Yes, faxes. <laughs> they did eventually get email and even until the last IPCC round there was still the disconnect between the two. They would email each other but there wasn't the seamless feedback. Which is in part because in part why we ended up seeing those scenarios. So again, when I first started, they had the SRES scenarios, for instance, and they had everything, people would act responsibly and they would change and things would go down. None of the scenarios where things would get worse. Whereas I reckon if they played it out in a connected model, they would have seen that, yes, there was the chance for things to have gotten worse. 
So they're starting to do these now in integrated assessments and earth system models where they are starting to dynamically connect them. It's still early days for that true dynamic connection, but it has started. At regional scales, um, it's a lot more interconnected. So you are starting to see where they pull in the different uses of the land or the environment, the different policy responses, the atmospheric and oceanic outcomes, and then the, the land state. And so this was 2008 when they were saying how they could do it, and it is actually in place now where they're playing it out. So in doing that, you have to think about cross-scale connection. So if you break up the world in its simplest form, you've got ecological, economic, social and cultural. At the really local patch scale, tiny patch scale, the local kind of areas around us, the regional. But actually that blows out an order of magnitude more. You've got the global um, and the physical. And in fact, um, in a paper led by Jess Melbourne Th Thomas, she broke it out one layer and had more. It had governance sitting out here as an extra layer in itself as well. So it's how to think about how you need to connect across. And the reason that's important is because if you're drawing one of these kind of models, you are thinking across processes at those different scales. So those that are in solid here, so if we're looking at fishing in the Caribbean, for instance, um, you've got what's happening at the local ecological uh, level for the, the fish and the habitat, you've got what's happening for the local families, then you've got um, how they go fishing and how that feeds into the economy, how the weather such as uh, storms are coming down and affecting that. Now you might not want to have the whole climate or the whole international trade system but you have to think about how those influence these so you can set up scenarios for different kinds of weather events or different kinds of economic demand and see how that flows through the rest of the rest of the system. So there's lots of different properties of this, so this is kind of a simple list. But yeah, you have to think about how they interconnect. And so Eva and her models of intermediate complexity are basically finding those linkage points. So she's, if this is the whole system here, you can see this kind of grey area, this amoeba over the top. This is what she would include in a mice model because she's just picking out the key players and the drivers of those. She hasn't tried to cover the whole lot. And a good way of doing that is to have coupling. So getting to the point about what you do with existing models, yes, you can try and create a model that brings it together in one set of code. That doesn't typically work these days. So you have what these brokers look like is becoming more refined. It's a new area of research that's been growing more productive there over the last few years. Um, you basically, you have the existing models and you find, instead of having one model that tries to suck in all the rest, which is the first approach, you have a piece of software that sits in the middle and acts like a knowledge broker between them. So it passes information backwards and forwards regardless of the format or the, even the language or operating system. So these models might even be on Windows, Linux, Mac, not even on the same computer, different parts of the world, and it's dealing with doing the communication backwards and forwards between them. What languages? Um, so the very first example I'm about to give you, we use the web services. We just use URL messaging to do it for us. So we're now starting to do it in more dedicated operational... We have computer guys who do that before me. I say, I want it to do this. Yeah. And Beck goes away and does it, but yeah. Uh, so often we are you finding that basing on a Linux server is the most efficient and it can then talk to the others through things like web servers. So this is an example in Australia where we needed to look at what was happening to these species of conservation concerns. So little tiny fairy penguins that are about this big. Um, killer whales that occasionally eat the fairy penguins but are quite big. And this is a handfish. Handfish are about this long and they have little fins and they walk along the bottom like they're walking on hands because humans in Australia aren't very good at naming things so we went for the obvious. <laughs> Maybe you are very good and you explain things. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> um, all of these interact in the Derwent River which has got an increasing number of salmon farms in it plus invading species. There's a Japanese starfish that has come in and changed the system. It's also an area where there's a lot of climate change. So we just we had questions about how do you do that kind of connection well. So we were doing a proof of concept as an early example where we took a biogeochemical model, we were connecting it to an existing eco-space model and then connecting it onto an agent-based model. Um, it was a rapid way of using existing models. 
But to give you a, a sort of a tangible ex explanation of what that looks like, we had the, the trophic model, the ecospace model for the food web, and we used Atlantis in this case. We could have used any other biogeochemical model to represent the, this part of the food web. So instead of having this part all inside ecospace, it basically replaced that part with what was coming out of the biogeochemical model. So you could operate on a finer scale um, with more processes than we really wanted to represent in the rest of the system. So the way that we did that was that we had the biogeochemical model follow through some of its food, uh, its steps, and then it would trigger, the broker would trigger the next uh, footprint of the, the big model. So you had this one produce the nutrients and plankton, it would pass that information through the broker to the plankton part of the ecopath model, which would then play out the ecopath, ecospace steps. Ecospace would say, well, out of all of that, you've got this much detritus and this much mortality on the plankton coming back the other way. That would re-enter the NPZD. So you had true two-way coupling between the different model types. So there's a lot of things to have to deal with that, though, because Atlantis uses the irregular grid and Ecospace uses a regular grid. So we have to think about how you map in space, and it was also that this one wasn't the same physical dimensions, it was only going to be for a, a smaller part of the system. We had to think about where there was, which groups were going to sit in which model, how did they map taxonomically, what was the mapping. They would being, there was also a mismatch between how Atlantis was calibrated and Ecospace was calibrated. So Atlantis, you start with a set of initial conditions and parameters and you tune towards the observational data. With Ecopath and Ecospace, they've taken the observational data, put it in as their input conditions and then played with it to get it to balance so that it made eco ecotrophic sense. Which is the standard way you do both model types. We brought them together, it was like, hmm, we've actually headed off in different directions as to what that actually meant. So we had to think about how we dealt with that. There's also the spatial mapping. So how do we take this polygonal grid and actually remap it to this spatial grid? You know, how do we, this one, so if you've got a, um, a grid cell that's completely within a polygon, that's fine. It's obviously just going to value to that polygon. But where you've got a grid cell that's across polygons, yeah. how do you deal with those situations? So that was something we had to tackle with interpolation and that kind of stuff. We also had to deal with the land. So this is where you find other people's coding clunches. They'd been storing a whole bunch of uh, information they needed in the ecopath and other parts in the land boxes, just as a, to keep the array size small. Okay, we're not using it to do dynamic calculations, so we'd use it as a storage drop point, um, except our lands didn't match up. So there was a little bit of difference in where the polygon to Atlantis was land and the ecospace was land, which then impacted the storage. So there's all those other kinds of bookkeeping you have to worry about. Yep. So how, you don't know much, but how does like, you account for edge effects in using the polygons and the grid? So edge effects, you mean yes. they're across, uh, things across multiple? Yeah. So it's just like, I want to know like, how that's translated from the grid to the polygons. Because you have like, the edge effects that kind of like, infinite that we can imagine, and that's right. Yeah, so we, had to, we ended up just using statistical interpolation. Yes. So we could play with the weighting. So if it was causing an anomaly, like a jet stream or something, that you see in the physics models quite a lot where they hit that kind of problem, you can downweight those cells to bring them back. So basically we've learned a lot from the data simulation methods or weather forecasters. So we use the methods that they do to draw their model back to the observations to smooth out the anomalies spatially. But it's not just space you have to think about, it's also time. So how do you deal with the fact that Atlantis was having 12 hour or less time steps? In fact, in true biogeochemical models you typically got minute time steps versus the monthly footprint of ecospace. So it was how do you deal with you know, it's got to take information from here. Does it smear it all the way through? Does it weight it at the start and tailor it off at the end? Should it be event driven? So we did try the smearing. That was one way. It's the most common way it's done. But another way is actually again to learn from the operating systems where you have a band of reasonable behaviour where if, it, if the eco path answer coming back is within this band, you don't bother telling Atlantis to change the values that it's using. If, however, it steps outside that band, then you trigger an update. 
So, and that band will shift backwards and forwards around that piece of information. So this would trigger one update, coming down here would have triggered another update. So that you, you're dealing with the, you have, it's more computationally efficient than having to respond every single time with the homogeneous smear. And you didn't get a hugely different outcome. So it's worth exploring those different ways of thinking about it. So is it a constant exchange of information or just when something important happens? Always technical difficulties arise. There was quite a bit of backwards and forwards and I was like, why is this not working? We did eventually get it to work. Now, this was the EWE representation of zooplankton. This was the Atlantis representation of zooplankton. This was the coupled one. So the coupled one actually managed to, for I think it was running 10,000 times faster, and got pretty close, so the observations are kind of, if I put them on there, are scattered across both of these. So Atlantis got fairly close to the observations as did the couple one, but for something that was 10,000 times faster, plus had the whole rest of the food web. Okay. So while Atlantis itself can do the whole rest of the food web, it does it a lot slower than EcoSpace. So it became, it was a proof of concept for us that this coupling process could actually work and be, be useful. And it's now, there's a lot of different groups around the world that are doing similar kind of coupling. What was the uncertainty like around this different? So in this particular case, because it's a proof of concept, we were oh. exploring uncertainty, but so it's like an to it, it is. It would be. It's much more useful to have this coupled one when you want to explore the uncertainty because it can go faster. so much faster. Yeah. So there's different model types. Like we said at the start, there's statistical, equation-based, agent-based and then there's the different ways you can link them together. Um, and so that's kind of, in a rush, that's the kinds of different models that you can use. Now I can either just switch straight over to Rashid, 